Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Every time I speak in front of an audience and I see a majority non-Syrian audience, it makes me very happy and very grateful that people still care to come out um, on your Friday night to hear about Syria. And, uh, and I thank you for remembering um, Syria and Aleppo and the people of Syria and being here tonight with us. The eternal city Aleppo lives beyond artifacts, beyond guidebooks, beyond history. The city transforms its people, bestowing a distinct Halabi touch to everything from cuisine to dialect. The city of stone, domes, and minarets form our identity and guide us through unwavering dedication to tradition. We are cartographers of memory, daring to etch our existence onto the city, but that existence remains a thin layer of dust upon Aleppo's deep, deep geological urban terrain. Our memories mesh with Aleppo's history as we continuously search for our place on the map. My Aleppo begins in my grandmother's home in the Sabil. The four-story four stone building with a jasmine-edged courtyard and an elevator, the most modern one on the narrow street. A microcosm of the city, my grandmother's home mapped our history, every room telling our stories. Here in the formal living room with the blue velvet chair twice a year on the first day of Eid, the 14 grandchildren lined up from oldest to youngest to receive money and kiss her thin hand. Here on the balcony that once seemed so high, my father's old bassinet holds her precious ferns. Here in the living room with the scratchy maroon couch, we spent a summer watching the sound of music over and over again. Here in the bedroom that I shared with her, the chandelier gently swayed every afternoon, registering the daily mini quakes, reminding us that we live on a geological fault line. Here is the white kitchen where thousands of Arabic and Turkish dishes were made for over 50 years. Here is the narrow balcony facing the street where I sat with her on the cool early mornings feeling so grown up as I dunked tea biscuits in steaming bitter coffee. The secrets of a city live within the stone walls. In every room a memory, on every street a story, as our city maps become a labyrinth of tangled stories with endless turns and no escape. Now my grandmother's building seems smaller every time I visit. <clears throat> Her balconies no longer soar into the sky. The narrow street, once so quiet, is now overcrowded with cars on both sides. Like Alice in Wonderland, I long for a magic potion to shrink my body and make my grandmother's building seem larger than life again, make the streets seem wide again, and make the city rise to my impossible expectations once again. I wrote this piece in 2011 while watching the Arab Spring in Egypt. It was submitted to a book of essays called My Aleppo. By the time it was published at the end of that year, I didn't know if I would ever visit Aleppo again. The city had changed, the country had changed, everything had changed in a way that we could have never imagined. One day in the fall of 2015, I was standing in front of a crowded classroom in a school for Syrian refugee kids in Reyhanli, a small town in southern Turkey, a few miles from the Syrian border, where the war was raging on and is still raging on. Reyhanli used to have a population of about 60,000 people before 2011. Today, over 125,000 Syrian refugees also call Reyhanli home. That day in school, I was giving a workshop with our organization, Karam Foundation, to the kids, and it's called Mapping Home. The kids were pretending to be urban planners designing their imagined cities of the future. I drew maps of my city, Aleppo, as an example. I explained parts of an ideal city, a central feature or emblem of the city, like the citadel of Aleppo or the Eiffel Tower, and in Reyhanli, a half-parched lake. I explained it's really not a lake, it's really a pond, but that's the only thing that the kids really recognize as an emblem. Uh, I explained how we need streets, schools, hospitals, and most importantly, homes in ideal cities. 
the fifth graders began to fill their papers with plans of their ideal cities. I squeezed between the highly packed wooden desks looking at their designs, and I saw beautiful designs full of whimsy and wonder. Families walking down wide boulevards, towers, citadels, gardens. One boy insisted on, insisted on using the edge of his book as a ruler to be more precise. They were so happy. But there, were also, there was also another common trend in the drawings. Many of the cities were located on the sea, with rows and rows of tiny pointy triangles. And I finally asked, what are those? One boy looked at me, surprised, and he said, that's the refugee camp. And I asked a girl, where is your city located? And she said, somewhere far, far away. And I asked her, where? And she said, you know, somewhere in Europe. Can you imagine a world where children can't even imagine an ideal city that doesn't have a refugee camp? I can't because six years ago, and I always ask this question, do you know how many Syrian refugees existed in the world? Any guess? Zero. Zero refugees exist, Syrian refugees existed. Today, there are over five million Syrian refugees like these kids. That's the population of Norway. With nowhere to go and nowhere to turn, home is a fragile dream. For, for some, home has been a tent for years now, and for others, it's a street corner or a storefront. Home can be a smuggled photo or your coveted house keys that you will never return to put into your own front door. And for families like my own, now scattered across the globe, home is where the WhatsApp is. <coughs> Six years ago, this was my home. This is how I remember it. But this Aleppo no longer exists. It exists only in my memory. And now every memory for Syrians has a permanent filter of death. When conflict hits home, nothing can prepare you for that pain, shock, and horror of watching your city being assaulted and destroyed every day for years. As an architect, however, my studies did prepare me in an unex unexpected way to think about cities and collective trauma. My first day of graduate school at MIT fell on September 11, 2001. In this new post-9-11 world, there was a certain gloomy mood that occupied the hallways of the history, theory, and criticism department in the architecture department at MIT. Seminars suddenly revolved around themes like urban trauma, memorials, collective memory, and the politics of reconstruction. We studied the large-scale post-war reconstruction projects underway at the time in cities like Berlin and Beirut, while protests against the looming Iraq war occupied the streets of Boston. We re-researched re re heritage while reading the news on the looting of Baghdad's antiquities. I wrote papers on topics as diverse as Peter Eisenman's Holocaust Memorial to the representation of power in French Baroque architecture while my homeland, Syria, and specifically my city, Aleppo, was always on my mind. My 2003 thesis, t entitled Recollecting Memory, Songs, Flags, and a Syrian Square, captured these ideas and theories that moved me. Lisa Widin, Louis Marin, Pierre Nora, they all had a place in my work on collective memory, national identity, reclaiming public space, the representation of power and the power of representation in an authoritarian state, and between the lines, its hidden, unspoken agenda, a desire for revolution. The thesis repeatedly connected the personal and collective experiences we have had as Syrians across historical moments in public and private spaces, and how Syrians found ways to subversely reclaim their spaces and voices in, in ways that temporarily detached them from the, from the state's control. One day I walked into my thesis advisor's office to discuss my latest draft. And she said, you're talking about these big national and historic events and symbols. You're talking about flags and public squares. And then suddenly we are in your living room talking about your mother's furniture. This French antique set, hand embroidered with the classical Romeo and Juliet design, was a centerpiece of my home in Aleppo. And my mother, who's very scientific usually, uncharacteristically out of emotional and not practical desire, simply bought it because simply the political idol of her youth, Jamal Abdel Nasser, had supposedly sat on this sofa once in 1958. <laughs> 
In my mind, this spatial collapse of scale between the intimate and the national made perfect sense. Our homes and objects always intersected with history and politics, telling stories about the past that were thinly veiled symbols about the present was one of the only safe ways of expressing yourself. In the same way, our private conversations were always part of the national state project to make fear seep into our most intimate spaces. The walls have ears as we were all raised. In Syria, the public and the private collapses all the time. Today, I don't know what has become of this room or its furniture, and those who looted our home will never know this sofa's story and what it meant to my mother. These objects now have another story about another time in Syrian history when darkness consumed everything. And I just realized this when I was preparing for this talk, that in 2012, I bought this sofa online, sight unseen, because it supposedly is made in Damascus because I wanted a piece of Syrian furniture in my home and I never made the connection that I did the very same thing that my mother did. The heart of my thesis was analyzing what I call memory maps. I asked families and friends to draw a central square in Aleppo, Sahel Sadal al Jabri, from memory. The result was sketched maps of the same square that were radically different depending on the age of the person who was drawing. The older generations drew annota annotated maps with personal memories superimposed on national and collective events. Moreover, the maps took a place on a specific date, like 1920 or 1958. The maps told stories of a specific time on a place. In this one, you can see the square as a space for assembly, even though it had not been used for public demonstrations for decades. And it also has, you know, where the, where the, the old Nahr al-Uwe was, the river, and it's just telling stories of a different time, even though this square was a place that we would pass through every single day if you're traveling through Aleppo. The younger Syrians, the ones who grew up under the Assad regime, often drew the, ma ma the square not as a place where events were remembered, but as a muted space where collective and meaningful urban events were absent. Their maps were eventless, memoryless, because silenced people equals silenced squ cities. We are, this is an image of um, Sahat Sadal al Jabri in 2002. We are taught as architects to think about urban planning as sweeping in from our all-knowing bird's eye view, from the scale of the city map to the plan of a square. We study circulation and access, pencil in a monument or a fountain as a focal point, and render in the trees for shade, all of the while trying to create this semi-enclosed space. But all of these technicalities and regulations and principles at the end do not make a public sphere. We all know the public sphere is made of the public. And when people stop or are stopped from using their squares or cities for what they were intended to do, to assemble, to gather, to occupy, to speak, to be heard, then the essence of the square evaporates into empty lines and unrealized expectations. As a result, these empty memory maps emerge to represent the empty square, to represent in their bareness the emptying of memory itself and what happens after the emptying of memory. After graduation, I continued to struggle to find a place for myself in the world. My mother would tell me, pull out your thesis, you should make it into a book. And I would answer, what's the point? Who would ever want to read about Syria? Then in 2011, the revolution sparked in Syria as the final and fatal domino effect of the Arab Spring. I watched with millions of Syrians in awe of what the people were chanting, what the banners said, which flags they were carrying, which spaces they were occupying and reclaiming. No more fear, no more acting as if, no more demonstrating as a clever deconstructionist play on words. No, they were demonstrating. And for the first time in decades, the public space in Syria was public once more. This is the University of Aleppo where I studied um, when the revolution came um, to the university. 
Inspired, I adopted a pseudonym and began to write the stories of Syrians I spoke to on a daily, on a daily basis. Mothers, university students, fighters, activists, citizen journalists, politicians, a full spectrum of Syrians from all across the country, all cities, villages, and towns. Slowly and unexpectedly, essay by essay, I became a writer. Those early elated days soon faded. More people were dying every day. The regime's bullets were replaced by tanks, tanks with barrel bombs, missiles, and chemical weapons. Torture, rape, starvation, drowning, extremism, mass displacement, these words became the reality of Syrian life. Death and destruction overshadowed the revolution and its demands for freedom and dignity. Nothing you study prepares you to witness the slow destruction and loss of your home and your country. Nothing prepares you for the moment that theory and history become your rea reality. Even when you're obsessed with memory like I am, nothing prepares you for the reality of living merely in memory. Nothing prepares you to have to understand these kinds of maps of Aleppo. The city reduced to blobs of color indicating the shifting front lines of battles between the regime, the rebels, the extremists, these rude blobs mov moving over the sites of our history and memory as if Aleppo was nothing but a war zone. And as the daughter of Aleppo, the timeless city, I never imagined I would have to write an article like this one. When I work with refugee children who are now growing up into refugee adults, we no longer speak of the past. I no longer ask them to draw from the past. We only draw the future, that unknown place that we can still shape in our minds, that space where everything is possible. It pains me to realize that when I do speak of Aleppo, I'm often describing a place to them that they no longer remember, and some of them never even had a chance to know. In that way, I feel like I have become a memory myself. Memory itself is a form of resistance against all the forces that want to erase what happened. And sometimes, I feel memory is the only place where we can be truly free. When I wrote my thesis, it felt bold and defiant and dangerous. And when I reread it now, I can't find a shred of courage in it compared to what any Syrian has experienced in the past six years. And I thought it was so brave and fearless to slip on a pseudonym and write. I thought that choosing truth was so brave. And it turns out that there's a million choices more courageous than telling the truth. Like choosing to protest on a, on a street waving a flag. Or choosing to record videos of protests and funerals with your phone. Or choosing to get on a smuggler's boat and entrusting your child's life with a faulty life jacket to seek a better future or choosing to go to school when you're 10 years old and have missed a couple of years and you've forgotten how to read and the kids will probably make fun of you, but you go anyways, or choosing to stay in Syria, or choosing to leave. It seems that we are trapped in this in-between life, between the past and the future, between hope and despair, between pride and shame, between regret and resilience, between displacement and belonging. And after life is bent, torn, exploded, there are shattered pieces that do not heal for years, if at all. What is left are scars and something else. Shame, I suppose. Shame for letting it all continue. I think a lot about this quote and many other texts by the late New York Times journalist Anthony Shadid, who inspired me to write about Syria, and he died in Syria. The collapse of my country at every level and scale occupies my mind at every moment of every day and night. The guilt and shame of living, of having a home, of being able to speak when so many paid the ultimate price just because they were there and I wasn't. This image is one of the last people of Aleppo, a group of doctors, teachers, journalists, mothers, children, Last December, after living under siege by the regime for months, tens of thousands of people were forcibly displaced from their homes in eastern Aleppo and taken away in green buses to become refugees. This group wanted to make sure everyone else was safe before they left, and they took this photo before saying goodbye to their city. We live in a world where such an image is taken and shared and becomes viral. We feel sympathy, empathy, and even awe. 
but nothing is being done to stop this from happening, to stop this from happening now to other people who are now in Idlib, who are now being forced to leave. To be Syrian is to hold these two contradicting truths at the same time, knowing without a doubt that there is nothing, nothing that you could have done to try to bend the world to your will, and knowing also without a doubt that you have done nothing at all. This is what it feels like to witness war devour your home from a distance, and this is what it's like to live in this in-between present, stretched between the crumbling past and the unknown future. In 2011, I wrote that I wished for a magic potion for Nana's building to expand again and reach my impossible expectations. But do you know what I think now? I think we as a people are not worthy of Aleppo. All of us are not worthy of Aleppo. And it is we that, we did, not, we that did not match her expectations for us as human beings. And now Aleppo looms ever larger in my memory as I grow smaller. My home is a memory, it is a dream, and it will haunt me forever. Yet in these dark moments, I turn to two certainties, what I learned from my architecture professors, from Aleppo to Ground Zero, from the texts written by those who also witnessed war, genocide, and urban trauma. In all these examples is, is an important lesson of history, that all wars end. Every people rebuilds their cities and countries in their own way. Eventually, memorials and museums will be commissioned in Syria. Ancient artifacts will be restored and the restorations will be fiercely con contested. Future architecture students will attend seminars, perhaps by space, about Syria as an example of both humanity's failure and humanity's resilience. And the other certainty comes from within my roots, my city of Aleppo one of the oldest surviving cities in the world. Being from Aleppo, the place as old as time itself, we know Syria will survive too. That is our destiny. It must be so. Until then, Syrians will carry their country within them, pulling their culture and heritage wherever they roam in their world. This is the final collapse of scale. Individual walking Syrias we have become. Sacks of collective memory of a nation that once was. They will tell their stories, and they will tell who they, uh, stories of who they once were in that place called Syria, that city called Aleppo, to anyone who will listen. And they will bravely map out their imagined futures while dreaming of home. Thank you.